We have been over the last two weeks or so been talking about new beginnings. We talked about being a man or a woman, a boy or girl of the altar. That in this season of new beginnings, we must be a people of the altar. Amen. That there can be no new beginnings except we make the Lord the king of our lives. There can be new beginnings in other areas. But when it comes to coming under the flood of God's favor, under the flood of God's ray, there can be no new beginnings except God is Lord in your life. The world system will tell you one thing. One thing I know is that the world system, as good as it may be, it is limited in that it does not have the God factor. And anything that does not have a God factor is limited in its ability to bring you to a permanent state of new beginnings. And as we talked about the altar, we talked about the demands of the altar. Friends, the altar will demand your life. The altar will demand your time. Hallelujah. Let me know if I need to switch this thing. You want me to switch? Come and do your magic. The altar will demand your time. The altar, friends, will demand your giving. The altar has three demands, and you must give those demands. Your life at the altar. Your time at the altar. Your giving at the altar. And when you come to the altar... God says, as much as I love your giving back to me of what I have given you, there is something that I need you to give me of most importance. I need you to give me your life. I need you to become a living sacrifice. And last week we were talking about being a living sacrifice. About becoming the living dead. Dead to the world, alive to God. There can be no new beginnings in life except we have died unto the Lord. That is why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Child of God, at whatever level of new beginnings you are trusting God for, these things have to be a factor in your life. Or else everything we are looking for will fall short. We will be excited for a little while at certain breakthroughs, but every level of breakthrough has its own challenges. Every level of breakthrough has its own devils to fight with, to fight. And unless and until you tap into the power of God, you will always be challenged in those, in those lives. Friends, when we began to look at this, we were looking at the altar that Elijah was building. There is something that Elijah built, and it was an altar to the Lord. And there are certain things that Elijah did at that altar that caused a level of fire, the fire of God to fall on that place. And my prayer for each one of us is that we must get to the place where the fire of God falls on your sacrifice. Amen. And unless and until you get there, you must refuse to settle for less. You must desire the fire of God over your life. But you see, on your way to the fire of God over your life, you need something that I call grace. Grace. And this morning, for a few minutes, I'd like to speak to you about grace for new beginnings. Grace for new beginnings. And by the grace of God, next week we'll be talking about the fire falling over our lives. Let's open our Bibles in Psalm chapter number 84. And verse number 11. Ooh, the worship was beautiful. Psalm 84 and verse number 
11. Psalm 84 verse number 11. Let's read together. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Speak to you for a few minutes on the grace for new beginnings. There are, um, this is not an in-depth teaching on grace. There's a particular topic when we are talking about grace, we can particularly deal with grace and its dimensions and, 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 and what grace is all about. But I'm speaking to you about the grace we need as we step into this season of new beginnings. Amen. And I know there is a lot of abuse when it comes to the teaching on grace. Uh, I want your eyes and your ears just to be open to what the Lord is saying in his word. Amen. Uh, it's kind of like driving a car and the car breaks down. You don't say, I'm not going to drive a car again. You go out and get it fixed and continue driving. Amen. Uh, the Bible says the Lord will give grace and glory. What is grace, friends? Grace is generally described as what? We have some that definition of grace, each one of us at some point, right? Grace is what? It's generally described as the favor and blessings of God which we do not deserve. Or the unmerited favor of God. The favor of God which can never be earned by our works. The favor of God and the blessings of God which can never come to us by reason of what we do. Friends, grace is a gift that God bestows upon his children. Grace comes from God. And God, friends, has bestowed grace upon his children since the beginning of time. Grace is a manifestation of God's power. Or you can say grace is, is God meeting us at our level of need, at our point of need. Through the person of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that grace is what caused Jesus Christ to come on this earth for you and me. Grace is a gift. The, the, the dimensions of grace, grace friends, is is, 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 is executed, grace is, 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 is given by God through Jesus Christ and it is the Holy Spirit who works out the grace in us. Many times when we talk about grace, friends, we are just thinking, oh yeah, favor, favor. But friends, grace is also a, not just a noun, but also a verb, a doing word. Grace is an active word in our lives. Because the energizer of grace in our lives is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who does things in our lives. He's the one who works in our lives to release grace and to activate the grace that God has given us. In the season of new beginnings, friends, I'd like you to understand that we can do a lot of things. We can talk about new beginnings. We can cry new beginnings. We can declare new beginnings. But until and unless the grace of God undergirds us, new beginnings becomes a myth. Until we step into the place where God favors us, until you step into a place where God opens the heaven for you, until you step into a place where the abundance of the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in you, new beginnings will be always be a struggle. Child of God, where the grace of God is at work, there is no struggle. You, 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 you will labor to do things, but you will not struggle to want to do those things. It takes grace. You see, when, when we talk about grace, we simplify it a lot when we just say favor. But you see, grace is the enabling power of God working in you that will cause you to do things that ordinarily you would not do. It is grace. And it is that kind of grace, friends, that we need. You see, grace is embodied in Jesus Christ. When Jesus went to the cross and he released grace, he released grace for everything you need. You, 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 you know, whatever you are looking for, it is, in, it is embodied in grace. Uh, that's why, you see, there are many faces of grace. And this morning, I'd like us to just look at 
at four dimensions of grace. Then I believe there's more dimensions, but there's at least four dimensions of grace that we, we should desire and hunger to walk in. Remember, the Bible tells us that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John chapter number one. There are so many scriptures about grace. But let's look at a few. John chapter number one. Let's look at uh, verse number. Let me get in there. John chapter number one. Look at verse number 15 or 16 somewhere there. And the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse number 16, it says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Let's read together verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So who brings this grace? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The first dimension, friends, of grace that we need to look at in our lives for new beginnings is saving grace. Saving grace. There is what is called common grace and special grace, but I'm not going into all of that. But saving grace, friends, is the grace of God that has appeared unto you and me for salvation. Look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, verse number 11, to verse number 14. Titus chapter 2 verse number 11 to verse number 14. I'd like us to read the scriptures together. Let's read together. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Up to verse 14. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the presence. Oh. Let's go back to verse 13. Who is teaching us that? Are we together? I want us to see this very clearly. Who is teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts? Who is teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age? In case you missed it, let's go back to verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God working in you must teach you to live righteously. Verse 13, must, verse 12 rather, must teach you to do what? To deny ungodliness. The grace of God must teach you to deny worldly lust. Ah, trust me friends, you cannot do it in your power. That is why people get up and say this year. I remember very well, very clearly, I was living this very, you know, kind of life when I was a young boy. And so I walked up to my father and I said, Daddy, this year, I'm going to be like my baby brother. So which one? I said, the one who goes to that church where they talk in languages. And I was talking about Pastor Muna then. I remember this very clearly. It was on January 1, 1990 something. 19, I think 1995. And I told him, I need to start living right. You know, and he said, yes, my son. In fact, I'm the one giving the word on New Year's or whatever service that first Sunday. And I said, I'm going to church with you. I remember my dad was so excited and we went to church together. But you know what? It was trying to do things in my own power because in me, I sensed that it was time for me to start doing things. What? Right. And so I went to church that Sunday. I was excited. I came back from there. I was fired up and uh, help me, friends. One week later. Because the grace of God in my life, I had not connected. I was trying to do things in my own power. One week later, I was back where I was the week before I told him it's time for me to do right. And that's where many of us, when we start the year, you always say this year things are changing. This year it is my year. It is my year. Things are changing. I'm on the Lord's side. I will never give up. I'm an overcomer. For the Lord God is on my side. Ah, you even jump. Ha! Marvelous year. 
You are marvelous, yeah. Hey, you are marvelous, yeah. Ma ah, marvelous, you oh. I will never settle for. And you leave this place, you're excited. Excited. And you go out there because you are doing things in your own power. Your own power. Guess what? Two weeks later, you're back in the same mess. And you start beating yourself. Oh my God. Why is it like this? Is it always me? Why? 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 Because we are not allowing the grace of God to step in and to teach us. We are trying to earn things by ourselves. The Bible says that if it is of, 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 of works, it is no longer grace. If it is something you want to do in your power. Listen, the Christian life, you cannot do it in your own power. You have to do it by the grace of God. And that is where many of us children of God, we are falling. And we feel like God, oh, you know, I just don't understand. Me, no, 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 no. It is because you have taken salvation as activity. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at Ephesians chapter number 2 and uh, verse number. Let's begin reading from verse number 5. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 5 and I'd like us to read together. Hallelujah. Am I screaming or talking? <clears throat> My voice <clears throat> is telling me otherwise. Let's read together. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Uh, let, let, let's, does it make sense to start in the middle of a sentence? Let's go back to verse 4. Let's go back quickly to verse 4. Uh -huh. Let's read together. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he may show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is a gift of God. Look at Romans chapter number 4. I think it's Romans chapter number 4. Uh, let's go to verse, I think, 24, somewhere there. Romans chapter 4, verse 24. The Bible... All right, let me give it to you real quickly. Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. Hallelujah. In, in, in Romans chapter number 4 and uh, verse number 14. Romans chapter 4 verse number 14. And we are going to read to verse number 16. The Bible reads, For, the, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made of no effect. Ephesians chapter 2 told us what? It is by grace we have been saved through faith. So, but if those of the law are heirs of this same salvation, then faith is made of no effect. Verse number 15, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now look at verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. So that the promise might be sure to all seed. Not of the law, not of works, but of grace. That is why the promise is sure to everyone. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, if you go back into verse number 3. Into verse number 3. Uh, sorry, verse number 2. Verse number two. The Bible reads, For if Abraham was justified by works, huh? are we together? Amen. 
If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If Abraham was justified, if you, you the, the way you live your life, you base it on the works that you do. You base it on your intellect. You base it on your business. You base it on your success. You have something to boast about with people, but not with God. Child of God. Listen to this. This is very important. Many of us, we are living life by, or we want to get into heaven through salvation by works. It doesn't help you. That's what we call legalism. He says, you have something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3. He says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God outside his works. Abraham believed God. And because of that, God opened an account for him in heaven called righteousness. And verse number four, he says, For if it is about works, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace. Now remember, what is grace? Grace is the the God reaching down to man, seeing man's need, and man has, has no ability to bring himself out. And God reaches down through Jesus Christ and brings you out. But he's saying, but if you coming to, serve, to, to being saved has everything to do with what you do, it is no longer grace but a debt. It means God owes you. But he's saying, in verse number 5, he says, but to him who does not work, let's read together, but to him who does not work, Work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. His faith is accounted for righteousness. To him who does not work. You see, let me help somebody here. You have a problem with fornication. What is fornication? You know what fornication is. Natural, spiritual. Now you begin to use your own ability to stop. You will stop for a month until you find the next girl. You will stop for a month until you go to the third girl. Until you get to a place where you say, I think for me, you know, I'm one of those who have been condemned to, to death. I remember I had a friend who used to say that and I used to, I started saying it as well. You know, the Bible says do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Because of their lifestyle and I was hanging out with them and they used, they used to say, us we're already dead, so let's just do things. That's what, that was their motivation. Ah, us we're already dead. And so I also started saying it. I remember one time I also said, ah, us we're already dead and I felt something in my heart just say, ah, are you sure? Trust me, they all died. I'm still alive. Because one day I stood up and said, no, 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 no. I'm not already dead. I'm not already dead. You see, he who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. I have located a God who would justify me without me trying to be good for myself. The minute you step into that place. And you see, that is why there is this abuse that says, oh, you know, we can be morally wrong. We can be morally bankrupt. We can see now. We can do this. Because you see, the grace of God will flow over us. Ah, But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. Let's continue that scripture. Verse 6. It says, just as David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Child of God. I like to, to, to encourage somebody that you need to tap into the saving grace of God. Tap into the saving grace of God. Look at uh, uh, chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. I told you it's not an exhaustive teaching on grace. I just want to bring out four key things about grace that we must run with in this year. Look at uh, Romans chapter number 5. Still talking about saving grace. Saving grace. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 5 that look, the God who justifies the the, the, the ungodly brings them to a place of righteousness so that the grace of God begins to teach them to deny ungodliness. Uh, 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 Romans chapter number 5 and uh, verse number Verse number 20. 
Verse number 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And that's why you see, listen, listen. The more we sin, the more grace comes. So it's okay, let us sin. Because grace is abundant. No, no, no. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul then says, listen, listen. I know that some of you here, you love this aspect that where sin is, there will be more grace. Uh, so in order for you to clearly understand what I'm saying, let me clarify. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. He says, listen, listen. So shall we then continue to sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. Verse 2. Certainly not! Exclamation mark. I am not saying start running around uh, and depositing your seed everywhere because there is grace. I'm saying no! How shall you die, you who died to sin, live again in sin? He's saying, listen, when the grace of God comes, the grace begins to teach you. Stop this. Stop this. Stop. You see, the grace of God, number one, brings you to a place of salvation and then begins to teach you how to do what? How to move away. So if you find that you are struggling in some sin, okay? Some of us will say, oh, pastor just likes talking about sexual sin because it's an easy thing to talk about. There are many private sins that each one of us in here, we, we are involved in that go, we need God to deal with us. For some of us, it is wrath, uncontrollable anger, works of the flesh. If you look at Galatians chapter 5, there are many things. Idolatry. Uh, so many things. Uh, but, but the Bible is saying, listen, the grace of God is abundantly able to save you. The grace of God has appeared unto you and me for salvation. Hallelujah. So we need to understand, friends, that if we are going to be a living sacrifice... We need the saving grace of God that will deliver us. Not our works. Not because I work in church. Not because I serve in the house of God. But because the grace of God is teaching me in my life. Hallelujah. Number two, friends. I'd like us to experience grace. At four dimensions. Number one, saving grace. Number two, sustaining grace. Number one, saving grace. Number two, sustaining grace. When the grace of God has saved you, guess what? The grace of God will sustain you. When you are going through issues, you are going through challenges, it is the grace of God that sustains you. In times of challenges... In times of difficulties, it is the grace of God. Not your solutions, not your strengths. When you are at the end of yourself, the grace of God will lift you up. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 8. Are we together? Look at somebody and tell them, I need the grace of God. Look at somebody else and tell them, I read in Psalm 84, 11, that God gives grace and glory. I need his grace. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 8 to verse number 9. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How many of you, when you're going through issues, you've been crying, God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, why? Where are you, Lord? I thought Pastor Zina said it is my season. Lord, where are you? Pastor Muna prophesied yesterday. God, where are you? Why, Lord? And God is saying, hey, hold up. Wipe your tears. Stop crying, Pastor Judy. My grace 
is sufficient for you. There is sufficiency in the grace of God to cause you to go above the issues and challenges of life. That is why he says in, in, in another place in the book of the Corinthians, he says that, that, that God will make a way out of escape for you. He says there is no temptation that has come upon man. If you can locate that for me. There is no temptation that has come upon man that is uncommon. But meaning whatever you go through, somebody else is going through it. And they have already gone through it. He says, but but God is able. God is able. How? Through his grace. He's able to make a way out for you. 1 Corinthians 10 verse number 13. My eyes are being renewed. Verse number 13. The Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful through his grace to do what? He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Ah, So don't ever come and say, ha, ha. I just couldn't help it. Ah, the temptation was too much. God says, whatever your level, God will provide you a safety net. And that safety net is the grace of God. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation also will make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. So this thing of I just couldn't help it, it doesn't wash with God. That's why God says you have something to boast about, but not with God. With men, yes. Listen, my my threshold may be higher than yours in one area or another. Your threshold may be higher than mine in one area or the other. But at whatever level, God has released the sufficiency of his grace to sustain you. Go and find the message that I preached. I think it's, it's your size. I was talking about this same thing. That you, can, you, 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 you cannot run around helter skelter crying, oh God me, God me, God me. God is able. God is able. I remember I was listening to uh, 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 a radio. And there was this lady. And she was talking about how she was involved in an accident. I think about 30 years plus ago. Uh, if I mention her name, you, you know her. She, she's an international figure. And... She became a paraplegic. Is it quadriplegic? Quadriplegic. And she started crying. You know, her prayer to God was, God, why me? Kill me, Lord. Kill me. Can you imagine? But 30 years of being that. God lifted her up. God brought her husband. God brought her children. From a wheelchair. In a wheelchair. And today she's in a wheelchair. Uh, the, the story, her story just really inspired me. And, and, and I started thinking about the sufficiency of the grace of God. And as I was driving, I was listening to this on Christian radio. And I said, God, I complain about silly things. I cry to you about silly things, but I still have my hands. I still have my eyes. I still, I still have everything. You know? I remember one time, I don't remember where it was, but I think this image is coming to me. I was talking to somebody and they were, you know, they were wearing these dark glasses and I I don't remember what we're talking about and they removed their their glasses and and I noticed that one eye is completely sunk in, it's gone, they had no eye. And I'm saying, God, here I am busy complaining, but I have both eyes. I don't know, friends, what you are going through, but the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you. So Paul realized this. And, and, and you know when, when, when Paul was talking about this, if you read earlier, it is because God had given Paul uh, uh, such great grace that he was doing rev- miracles, revelations and everywhere, and yet he had a problem. And so he was asking God, God, here I am on fire for you, serving you, but why do I have this problem? And so God says, don't worry about that. My grace is enough for you. That's why Paul is saying, oh, therefore I'll boast in my areas of weakness so that the power of God may be even greater in my life. I look at myself and many times, sometimes I'm saying, God, why am I going through this? Why am I going through that? And yet, God, you are doing this with me. You are doing that with me. Ah, God will just sit you down and say, shut up, boy. There's enough grace. 
So I don't know what you're going through, child of God. I don't know where you are in life. But there is enough grace. There is enough grace to lift you up. Amen. Mm. I don't want to take this to next week. What was number one? Number two? Number three, enabling grace. Enabling grace. Remember, the grace of God saves you and teaches you to live right. The number two, the grace of God in the new, new beginnings, not only will he just leave you saved, but he will sustain you in your time of trouble. Number three, the grace of God will enable you to be fruitful. The grace of God will enable you to energize you to be successful in life. Whatever it is that you're seeking God for, the grace of God is what will cause you to labor. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, let us read together. But by the grace of God, I'm not hearing you. Let's start again. But by the grace of God, I am what? And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I can spend a whole sermon on this scripture. Because this scripture really inspires me. This was Paul. Think about this, friends. This was Paul. Maybe to understand this better, let's begin from verse number 8. Verse number 8. Let's read. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now, understand Paul, friends. We all know Paul, right? The guy that was called Saul. Persecuted the church, killed the church. He arrived on the scene after Jesus has gone. Amen? But then what does he say? He says, listen, I am what I am by the grace of God. I was a killer, I was a persecutor, but God's saving grace located me. When God's saving grace located me, his sustaining grace kept me. But not only that, there's a dimension of grace that came to my life that I refused to waste. Other versions say I, the grace of, I did not waste the grace of God. Many of us are wasting the grace of God. The enabling grace of God. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all. Oh, Have you noticed something? I labored more abundantly than they all. Who is they all? All does all mean one? All means how many? Many. He's saying me alone, Paul. I worked more than them. Who was them? Peter, John, Matthew. Aha, uh -huh, the soul, the ones you call. Aha, uh -huh, the Thomases. He says, I labored more than them. The same one whom they said, Peter, you are the rock. I'll build my, I labored more than him. If you go into the book of Peter, I forget the scripture. Peter even writes, he says, the things that Paul writes. They are hard to understand. Eh? But he says, I worked more than them. He's saying, listen, I'm not boasting. I am just telling you that the grace of God in my life, I did not waste it. I was one born out of season and I had to make up for it. And I began to labor abundantly. He said, I labored abundantly. Listen, when you look at the teaching on grace, it is written mainly by Paul. Because this is a man who understood that God took me out of the doldrums. This is a man who understood that my, my, my past does not determine my future. This is a man who understood that I could be a nothing today. But tomorrow, by the grace of God, I'll be a somebody. 
This is a man of God who understood that it doesn't matter what people say about me. As long as I locate saving grace, I locate sustaining grace, God will enable me to be successful in every area that I have called, I've been called to. Whether it is in business, whether you're a technocrat, wherever you are, whether it's in academics, wherever you are, the grace of God will cause you to labor more abundantly. It doesn't matter how many people have gone ahead of you. Ah, child of God. Listen, sometimes we want to do things in our own power, in our own energy. Ah, they were married five years before me. Oh, what is going on? God will bring you a, a man or a woman. Ah, instead of one child, they'll give you three. Three plates. Pa! Huh. Okay. It's not children. Maybe it's business. How many of you read stories and you, and you even start sharing it? Cha -cha. Ha! Did you see this business? Which one? Combe International. What about it? Ah, they just started yesterday. But look at them. They have already gone to 50 states. Oh, and then you start comparing with the business that started 30 years ago. We say, wait, when did Combe International start? Last year. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about Combe International. I'm talking about Kalenzi Sophistication. <laughs> oh, when did they start? They just started two months ago, but they've already gone global. It is not you, but the grace of God working in you. Haven't you noticed in your place of work there are people that have gone ahead of you? Because grace is not sufficient, they start telling you, you will flop. But you, you step in with the enabling grace of God. You look at that project with eyes that they have not seen. You begin to see loopholes where there were no loopholes. You begin to see opportunity where there was no opportunity. When you provide the document, they say, ah, this is the one we've been looking for. Because of the grace of God over your life. In new beginnings, child of God. Ha! You notice there is a progression. Many of us, we are looking for enabling grace. But we want to ignore sustaining grace. Many of us are looking for enabling grace. But we want to ignore saving grace. It cannot happen. There has to be the grace of God that must appear unto you. To bring you out of the doldrum. To bring you out of the dungeon. To sustain you in a time of nothingness. And to cause you to excel. And to labor more abundantly than they are. The, not, no, 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 no. It was not me. He says, not I. I don't want you to start saying that guy is good. That guy is this. No, no. It is the grace. Let me tell you, friends. One time I remember I was preaching somewhere. I was one of the speakers in a conference. And in that conference, there was one of the speakers was a bishop. And they did what they did. And I did not know that everybody was looking at me because, you know, quiet me. So I did not know they were sizing me up. And this was somewhere on the East Coast. Oh, we're on the East Coast, eh? But yeah, some state on the East Coast. And so when I came to preach, when I was done, and the power of God had messed the whole place up, the bishop, I still remember this because it stuck so much. The bishop came to me and he said, Ha, ah, young man, that thing you're teaching, I've been preaching for 30 years, I've not heard it. I, 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 and wow, this, I need you to come to, to our church. And he was immediately invited for a conference. When I left, this was, you know, when you are young in ministry, I think we were still at 501 those days, maybe. I don't remember. Uh, no, 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 I think 850, I don't remember, but several years ago. And I was there feeling good. Ha, God used me. And God just sat me down in that room and he said, shut up. It is not you. The day you say it is you, I will leave you. It is my grace working in you. That day was a day in humility. It was a day from that day I said, God, please, whatever you do, never take away humility from me. The Bible says it gives grace to the humble. And I've seen the hand of God over my life, all the days of my life. Even doing ministry, even as a church, agape, trust me, if it was not the grace of God, we would not be here today. But the grace of God. 
I, I, I was sharing this. I was, we were driving with my wife and I was saying, do you know that this 6728 is, is the longest place we've actually been to? Because we were, when we started, we were two years at a school. We were about four years, I think almost four years at that basement. And we were another two years at, uh, at 8.50. We are four years in this place. I, 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 and, and I look at, when you look at where we've come from, and you look at where we are, you'll be saying, hmm, we are not supposed to be there. Are, are you hearing me, friends? But it is the grace, not your ability, but the grace of God on your life. Are you hearing me, friends? So, when you are in your place of work, when you are in your zone, when you are in your home, don't think you are the one who makes that marriage work. Many people, they look at other people's marriage and say, hey, that one, hey, 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 that one. <laughs> Never ever think it is by your own power. It is the grace of God, the enabling grace of God that enables you to keep your marriage. So don't start looking at other people. You don't know what they go through. Right. Some people look nice. You, you see Mercy and me, we look shabby, shabby, shabby. Ah, but you're not in our bedroom. Maybe there was fire in there before we came out. And we show up in church. Hi, honey. <laughs> the grace of God. No, now don't go and start saying, no, pastor, the, in the bedroom there's fire. <laughs> Um, no, I'm just saying because I know my marriage. Oh. It can stand in the bedroom and outside. Ah. Hallelujah. Let me finish this thing. Let me finish this thing. Number one, saving grace. Number two, sustaining grace. Number three, enabling grace. Number four, giving grace. It's a grace that nobody likes, but everybody wants. Mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Bear with me. We'll finish in a minute. And we're still having workers training. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. What was that? The grace, right? Of God. That was in Macedonia. I'll, I'll speak more about this when I'm teaching on, on, the, on the power of giving. Let's look at uh, verse number... Let me quickly go there. Verse number 8. Verse number 7, sorry. Verse number 7. Let's jump to verse number 7. Let us read together. But as you abound in everything, in faith. Now, hold on. As you read it, chew the words. As you abound, what is to abound? As you increase in everything. And what's that everything? He doesn't want you to start imagining everything as McDonald's, Burger King. No, 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 no. He's saying, let me tell you what you should increase in. Uh -huh. Number one, he said what? Increase in faith. Increase in speech. No, 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 just talking, talking anyhow. No, no, no. Speech that produces grace. In knowledge, as you increase in diligence, as you increase in your love, make sure that you abound in this grace also. Which grace is he talking about? Have you noticed that there's many graces? He says, in this particular grace, which grace? The grace that the churches of Macedonia had. And uh, uh, he continues in verse 9. He says, for you know, oh, oh, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Oh, is he talking about other things here or is he talking about giving? He's talking about giving. Now he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what it did. There is a grace in giving. He says you should excel in this grace also. Now, let's jump to chapter 9. Let's jump to chapter 9, verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 6. And we're going to read verse 6 to verse number 10. Let's read together. But this I say, he who sows sparingly 
will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now may he who supplies seeds to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now real quick, let's talk about this. So he's saying, I want to bring you, Emmanuel, to the church of Macedonia. I want to remind you that they had a grace, although they were poor, Although they had poverty, but they had greater joy in giving. And Paul is saying, I want you to know that giving is a grace. Help me, friends. If you struggle to give, number one, in the house of God, number two, to, to others in need, you need to check whether the grace is there. It's not me saying it, it's the Bible. If you struggle, and you say, no, for me, Pastor C will just get $15. That's it. Even if I could give him $100, I'm not talking about me. I'm saying the church. Because many of you give to the church and think you're giving to me. No, you're not giving to me. You're giving to the church. This is it. Trust me, child of God. It's the word of God. He says, grace to give will do what? Will trigger all grace. Look at verse number 8. Grace to give will trigger all grace. He says God is able to do what? To make all grace abound toward you. Now, have you noticed why many of us we struggle? We have no problem with saving grace. We have no problem with sustaining grace. We have no problem with enabling grace. But when it comes to giving grace, ay, ay, ay. and God is saying, listen, do this simple thing. All grace will abound, will increase to not trickle like small tap water. Abundance where you start. Let's leave that thing alone. <laughs> we are looking for breakthroughs. We are looking for turnarounds. But what is God saying? God says, he who sows sparingly. Let me help somebody by sparingly. Sparingly means, uh, you're, you're, you're an engineer, tell us something about spare. Uh, spare. When you're driving a car, what do they say? Make sure you have your spare wheel. Huh? Your spare, the thing you don't use. Your spare change, brother Albert. So, he's saying, those that give God their spare change. They will also reap from God, God's spare change. Uh, uh, is it me talking? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Oh, there it is. He who sows sparingly will also reap spare change. So many of us, we're always on the periphery of God's blessing. And, and, and God is saying, no, 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 no. I want, this is all yours. But I need your heart. Because listen, you cannot step into the grace of giving except you've given your heart to God. It is a heart that's totally given to God. It is that kind of heart like the Macedonians that will give their all to Jesus. When, if you want to understand the grace of the Macedonians, go to Philippians. That's why many of us we are quoting, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, 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 but what about the other one? Yeah, no, no I can do all things. Yeah, is, is it? I can do all things. Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things. But that was Paul talking. Now, the, 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 when he, he, well, let me quickly, quickly go there. Ah, I don't know why that scripture dropped into my heart. Let me give it to you. Uh, Philippians chapter, well, the Macedonian church is a Philippian church. When you quickly look at uh, uh, Philippians, uh, when Paul was talking, he says, uh, listen, uh, when I received the gift that you gave me, I received it. And because I received it, I want you to know 
that what the things that you gave me, they have really blessed me. They have really blessed me. And because of that, I want you to know that in, in all these things that you have done, God will supply. That's the scripture I was looking for. God will supply all your needs. So many of us, we cry. God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. That scripture is triggered by sowing. That's why many of us, we claim scriptures that don't work in our lives. This is not. God shall supply all my need. Oh, have you triggered it? Have you pulled the trigger for God to supply? That trigger is pulled by your giving. Child of God, in this year of new beginnings, God's grace must abound. Saving grace, sustaining grace, enabling grace, giving grace. May the Lord help you in the areas of struggle. I commend you to the grace of God which is able to build you up. The grace of God which is able to establish you. The grace of God which is able to shift you, to change things in your life. May that grace of God cause you to step into new seasons, into new beginnings. Because you have given your life as a living sacrifice. May his grace abound. According to Psalm 84 verse 11, the God gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk right before him. It is the grace of God that will enable you to walk right before him. If you have not given your life to Jesus as the Lord and Savior, child of God, that's your first step. That is your first step. Saving grace is your first step. And walk in confidence knowing that his grace will sustain you. That his grace will enable you to do exploits and be fruitful. And above all friends, his grace will cause you to be generous and trigger all grace to abound toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen.